Service Finder, which is an application um, that helps um, people from the medical profession um, to find services for, for patients. So, um, BGSS has been engaged for the last couple for the last year uh, to build the, the next version of uh, Service Finder. Um, it's obviously a much improved version. It's faster, more reliable, more mobile friendly. At the moment, we're in private beta. Uh, in November, we're moving to public beta, so we're going to go from 136 users to over 2,500 users. And it's not just used by 111, but also by medical professionals like you know, pharmacists, GPs, paramedics, etc. Now, as part of the team, there's me. Um, I'm a platform engineer. Um, I work with a bunch of developers, um, another tester. Um, so my scope is basically the CICD pipelines of all the infrastructure, basically. Uh, that's the tech stack that kind of I work with at the moment. And yeah, my role within the project is basically, but the way I see it is making developers' life easier. Right. So this is kind of the, the infrastructure of Service Finder. Very sort of summarized, it's only the main bits here. Here on the left, you can see we have two front ends. So we have a main UI and we have a reporting UI in Service Finder um, that is served using CloudFront. Then we have three backend services, um, the API, main API, feedback, and, and the authentication service, which run in ECS, so they run in basically in uh, containers in Amazon. And then we have another bunch of services. Some of them are used by, by the backend services. Some of them are just there, like CloudWatch, monitoring everything, and you know, making sure that everything is working as it should. There you go. Now, in terms of the pipeline, um, I'm going to ask another question. How many of you are uh, familiar with the concept of continuous integration and continuous delivery? <coughs> Good. I mean, you all should. <laughs> so, uh, I'll explain anyway. So, here we have a coder, so he's working on a really cool feature or a bug. And when his change is finished, he just push the code to a version control system. In our case, it's GitLab. And that, that's basically continuous integration. It's the, the practice among developers to, um, uh, you know, to push changes to a centralized repository, repository um, typically a few times a day. Now, when we push a change, our pipeline, so Jenkins, is going gonna, is gonna to pick up that change. It's going to pull it and it's going to run the pipeline. So running the pipeline basically, basically means that it's going, to pull, um, it's going to pull that branch and it's going to build a local environment in one of its agents and then it's going to run some tests. And if everything goes well, it's going to push a new set of artifacts to AWS. Um, so that's continuous delivery. But that, that's what we do um, as opposed to continuous deployment. We don't deploy straight away to production, but we have our artifacts are ready to be deployed to production with just one click. Right, so what exactly happens in Jenkins? So here you can see uh, an example of a pipeline that has run. Everything has succeeded, thankfully. And the first thing that happens is the checkout. So we pull the branch. So we have it locally. Uh, next stage, while well, we update Terraform binary, then we run Terraform apply. So within our repository we have some Terraform code that we're going to run against um, a development environment that is going to use by Jenkins. <coughs> um, when that's finished, we're going to start building um, our Docker images in our local environment. So we have, we use Gradle and we have a Docker Compose file, so it's you know, a local environment, a local Dockerized environment. 
and then we run a, a bunch of tests, API tests, integration tests. Here on the left, you can see that we have some reports that we generate as well, so you can get all the details from those tests. Uh, we also have all the Docker logs, which is pretty cool. We haven't been quite very proud of this. Um, I dealt with a plugin called HTML Publisher. And so all the logs from all the containers um, are here, so it's quite easy to troubleshoot if you have a, you know, an issue with building. So after that, we publish the artifacts to AWS. I'm going to go into more detail now in a minute with that. And then at the end, we generate the test reports that are on the left. And we just clean up whatever you know remaining containers or whatever are in the agent. Now on the left side as well, you can see that for every successful build, we version our artifacts. Uh, the version is basically made out of a uh, substring of the branch uh, name, the build number in Jenkins, and the short commit ID of that branch in particular. Now, in terms of the publishing, what happens here is that when we build our environment and the tests are all fine, um, as you remember, I said we have two front ends and three services in the back end. So the two front ends, we just take all the static files and push them into what we call stable buckets. And the back end images, we just take the images that we generated and we copy them into ECR repositories, the stable ECR repositories. That's, these are our stable resources. So obviously they have a version um, in order to know which version we're using. Uh, in ECR, we basically tag them with that version. Uh, for SC, what we do is just we create a directory which creates a version. So in, inside those directories, we have our files. So just to see more clearly here, um, in ECR here, we can see we filter by stable. We see our three stable repositories. If we go into one of them and filter again by you know a string from our branch, we can see we have um, two Docker images here with the with the version uh, as tags. Same if we move into S3, we have two stable buckets. Inside the buckets, uh, we have. Uh, folders, obviously I'm filtering there, and um, inside the, one of these folders we have all the static files that we generated for that version, right? So we have a bunch of different versions of, you know, stable artifacts that we keep and then we can deploy whatever we want. Right, um, so let's go back here for a second. I'm very thirsty of this pizza. Um, so, as I said, this is the service finder diagram of you know, the architecture diagram. And yeah, that's, that's quite nice, but we actually want this, this right? We want to have multiple identical disposable environments. Um, basically what we want is to have, to be able to, you know, create as many environments as we want that they are exactly like production. So when we try and push a change into one of our development environments, if something breaks or if it works, we have the confidence that then in production it's not gonna break. Now, obviously, we're not going to do that manually, so we use infrastructure as code. So, in our case, we use Terraform to do this. Um, everybody familiar with the concept of infrastructure as code? Good. Well, for those who don't know it, infrastructure as code is the process of managing and provisioning computer data centers through machine readable definition of files, like you know Terraform files. They're um, um, rather than basically physical hardware configuration or interactive configuration tools. So some examples are Terraform, um, ARM templates for Azure, CloudFormation for AWS, <coughs> or we have Solid or Ansible or uh, Chef, whatever. Now for me to explain how I manage to do this, um, I, I'm gonna start explaining how I basically lay out my um, directory structure with Terraform. So I have three main folders. Um, the first one is called uh, AWS Bootstrap, and is, I basically run it twice in my life. So I have two AWS accounts. It just runs at the very start. Uh, what it does is basically creates a DynamoDB table to manage the logs and a nested bucket to, to store the state files. So once that's created, that's it. We can forget about it. Um, I'm actually considering moving to Terraform Cloud. I'm not sure if I'll get there, but I think it's a better solution. But anyway. So then I have a folder called Common Infra for the Common Infrastructure. Um, yeah, so when I start thinking about this, um, one of the things I realize is that if I want to have 10 different environments, there's still going to be 
resources that need to be shared. Think about VPC. I don't want to create a VPC for each environment, right? I want to have one VPC and then put all the environments on top of that. Um, as well, with the common infra, um, I, I use it to, the, to provision my management infrastructure, so the Jenkins server, the Bastion server, all the security groups around it, etc. And this common infra, it gets run every now and then, you know, when there's a change, it's running manually against production and against development, uh, not in that order. <laughs> and obviously to manage some of the differences, for example, we don't have changes in production, what I do is like, I use flags, so I, I use a count variable, I detect which environment I'm uh, provisioning against, so if it's dev, I create my bastion here, for example, if it's production, I don't need a bastion server, so I don't create. Um, and the third one, obviously, is the service finder environment, <coughs> which contain, contains all the Terraform required to create our service finder environment. So, in order to manage multiple environments, what I use is Terraform workspaces, which provides with a mechanism to manage different state files for different environments, you know, using the same um, code base. Um, Now the other thing uh, that I want to explain about this is that obviously in order, in order for um, our service finder environments to be able to use the common infrastructure that is there beforehand, um, what I do is I use data resources, I don't know for whether you are, are familiar with Terraform, um, if I look at the common infrastructure when I create a VPC, I use a resource VPC, so I actually create a VPC. In the service finder environment, the VPC already exists, so it's create a data resource. So uh, basically using the tag to match the VPC I want to use. And it doesn't need to be created, it's just literally pointing at it, right? Okay, so some challenges that I faced when I started doing this. First of all, I thought, well, I'm gonna have to um, pick up different subnets for every environment. And I definitely don't wanna go into AWS and look for free softness and I definitely want my fellow developers to do that because they're you know really busy. So this is this is not um, something I want to do manually. Um, another thing I don't want to do manually is even though Terraform workspaces is fairly simple and nice to use, uh, to switch between workspaces is also very, very simple and easy to apply your Terraform against the wrong environment if you forgot to switch. So that can lead to you know human error very very easily. And finally, um, we use uh, TFRs um, to, you know, to, to pass to uh, Terraform, which basically contains the, uh, the subnets that the environment is going to use. And I don't want to have these TFRs locally because that means I'm tied up to my machine and if I want to share my environment with someone else, I have to pass in that TFRs and, you know, so I want to have it remotely somewhere. <coughs> so how do they fix that? Obviously, I automate it all. So I created a big script that was able to do all of that is, is able to create, delete environments, list all the environments, etc. Um, with a fairly simple uh, syntax, is able to match the Terraform more spaces, um, is able to go and look for subnets that are free, uh, push, put them in our TFRs, uh, store the TFRs remotely, and also is able to actually create or update certain modules rather than the whole environment. We don't use that feature very often, but it's there. Right, so this is kind of how it works, it's from SFM, apply DP test. DP test is an environment that at this point it exists already. So um, it's basically gonna give us some feedback at the start in terms of where are we applying and so on. And then it's gonna run a Terraform init to initialize our environment. Um, it's gonna detect that we already have a DP test TF bars uh, available in our S3 bucket. So it's gonna pull it locally and it's gonna work with that. And then it's just gonna run the plan Oh, by the way, that's the TFRs that basically contains the, you know, the, the IPs of the of our subnets. So it's gonna tell us, okay, I need to add new uh, 21 new resources. It's gonna run apply, and a couple of minutes later, that's it, it's done. Um, so we've updated our DP test environment. So. Now, obviously, updating like that your infrastructure, if assuming it's a, it's a new environment, uh, you'd have nothing on top of it. Right, you need to also push your, your application on top, which Terraform is not doing. So to do that, I wrap everything up in a, in a Jenkins 
pipeline. So I created this build and publish job, and if we create in a bit more parameters, you get this. So it kind of mimics what the script does. Um, we can select the actions that we want to apply or delete, etc. We can select the modules, the name of our environment, the number of subnets, which basically means the number of availability zones where our backend services are available. Then we pick the version from the list of stable versions that I mentioned earlier. If we want to debug or not, and a nice gift for Chuck Norris to give some encouragement there. <laughs> So um, we click on build, we wait a little bit, go for a coffee, and after about 30 minutes, you can see that the, the, the job has succeeded. Updating the infrastructure took the longest, about 33 minutes to create all the Terraform infrastructure. Um, half of the time is probably the cloud formation, the cloud front uh, distributions take a long time. And just to go a bit more in detail, the first thing that happens obviously is the checkout. So it's gonna pull uh, it's going to check out from, from GitLab. Uh, it's going to do a check out based on the commit ID that is part of the version. So if you look in the log, that's the version that we selected. That's the commit ID that we're checking out, and you can see it actually matches. Right? So once we have our code, we can start updating our infrastructure. You can see the new environment here. So we're creating our new dev TFRs, populating our subnets pushing it to our uh, S3 bucket, and then just starting with Terraform. So we have 152 resources to create a new environment from scratch, which basically represents that. Obviously, there's lots of missing there. <laughs> and after half an hour, we get this, right? So Terraform has created all the resources. It's showing us the URLs. Obviously, the URLs are pointed to nowhere at this point in time. We need to publish the artifacts, which I'll go in a minute. Uh, there you go. So um, remember before I was saying um, during our pipeline we push our version of, uh, our version artifacts to our stable release. So now what we're doing is from the stable release we pick that version and put it into our environment. So we copy the S3 files directly to the S3 buckets and we copy the images and then we start the services. Right, so you can see here we copy from the stable bucket to our environment bucket. Uh, that's the version we pick, so it's, one, it's a directory inside the stable bucket, and then the file, and like that, obviously all the files. In terms of the images, we pull the image locally from the stable, we push to our environment bucket, we kick off the services, and there you go, when that's done, uh, we just run some smoke tests, we clean up everything, and there you go. We have our service, find the environment, ready to go in about 30, Sometimes less, sometimes more. There you go, you can see that the URL matches. So that's it. Um, conclusion, what I would like to remember are three things. First, automate everything. Obviously, you're going to reduce risk. You're going to increase reliability, reduce cost, etc., etc. I mean, you can't go wrong automating. Everything as code, make everything as code. Not just your infrastructure, but also your pipelines, your pipeline properties. Um, uh, your images, we use Packer as well to, you know, everything, everything is version so we can keep track of everything. And as a result, we have disposable infrastructure. If we lose production, we know we're back up in half an hour, max. If we lose our Jenkins, we have Jenkins back in 10 minutes, exactly how it was. And, you know, that's the way it should be. So there you go, automate everything, everything is code, disposable infrastructure. Thank you. Buckets. What about images um, resources which no longer exist or need to be deleted or in terms of like old branches and things like that? Um, I was thinking you had a, like a favicon or an index HTML or an index JS or a hello gif. If hello gif doesn't exist anymore, does that get deleted from your target bucket or was I misunderstanding? Mm, I'm not sure if I understand. So basically what we have in our, our stable buckets is exactly the contents of um, you know the 
when the pipeline run with this exact version. So if you want that version, it's going to copy exactly those files into your environment. So if I've, if I've re renamed hello gift uh, goodbye gift, yeah. what, what do it? I end up with in my prod bucket when I've run the process? Well, why would you rename it? Because <laughs> <laughs> I it's my PR tool, which I don't know. Well, see, you, you're not automating that. I mean, you should, if you rename something, you should push it into GitLab from the pipeline. Oh, yeah, no, so the pipeline has now pushed a thing called goodbye gif. But yesterday, if it, when it ran it, it pushed hello gif. Today, when I run it, it pushes goodbye gif. I've got hello gif in the, in the prod bucket. Okay. Now, I've now got goodbye gif. In your stable bucket? Yeah, so when I copy stable to prod, do I get both GIFs? Or no, 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 it gets cleaned up. It gets right. cleaned, yeah, yeah, it gets yeah, wiped. Gets oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Because you do a sync, you wouldn't do a copy. Okay, do a and if I want to go back to last week's build, yeah. how, do I, how do I, if I've now lost the uh, GIF, how do I go back to last week's? Okay, let me just, sorry, I just click and close that too quickly. So, if you want to go back to last week, uh, go here. I mean, this is just a screenshot. But if you go into version, you, would, you know, you would have a, a big lot of versions. So that's an aggregate version of all of those half dozen pipelines. All the stable artifacts yeah. that are available will pop out there. So, I mean, so that's typically. A, that's a composite version of those half a dozen individual. So what is showing here in version is the list of versions that we have available as stable uh, resources. So you had half of the <coughs> pipelines publishing individually at different, different times? Yeah. Is that, is that, is that, that's a composite version of those, that's a point in time. Yeah, this is real time. So um, basically, when, when this form appears, there's a group script in back that is basically going to list in real time all versions we have available. Sorry, I'm, I'm probably not explaining myself properly. You've showed the pipelines for your half dozen different things you publish, the back end, front end. Right there, the back no, the pipeline, so the pipeline creates the artifacts. Yeah, so, so you had six, you had six of them, didn't you? But they were all, all named the same. They're, they're, so <coughs> so they, have, they all have the same tag, basically, and that's selecting the tag. Okay, so you, you, you're conglomerating everything into a version at compiler time. Yeah, exactly. They're all the same version. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, if, if we had different components with different versions, I would be. Uh, I'm not, no, no. Everything is on the same version, thankfully. Yeah, I, including the Terraform. So, initially, when we started working on this, the Terraform was kind of apart, and we weren't kind of versioning Terraform. But then we realized that sometimes the code there might be something new that is needs a new Terraform resource. And if you're using an older version of Terraform, obviously it breaks. So we keep everything in the same version. So when, when you deploy version, develop, whatever, all the Terraform, everything is at the same version. So you've got half a dozen teams, half a dozen pipelines. I have to pick up his if I take mine, because it's a compile time aggregation into a, into a version. That's fine. I mean, it's, just, it's a horrible nut to crack. No, because you'd have the branch, so you'd walk your own changes. That's what the development is like. So you'd have your own. Yeah, there's like, I mean, there's multiple branches running at the same time. And then at any point in time when you come here and try to, to publish something, whatever is available as stable uh, artifacts, so whatever pipelines have passed and published those into the stable resources, it's going to be available here. So you can perfectly find have you know, different developers working in different branches. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Um. I'm curious, you're running, it sounds like you're running a mono repo if you've got everything the same sharp. Yeah, we do, yeah. Because uh, our work, we don't. We have probably about 12 to 15 different repos. Because one, I know the Google approach to mono repo is great. We've got a terabyte of repo. Um, but <coughs> we have like um, sub repos and sub branches and all that stuff. Plus, yeah. also, don't want it all in one because it's massive and we don't want different teams working on different stuff. And the chance of breaking someone else's code base because we have about six different teams writing C code and better C to Erlang to Go to Node to so we don't all in one. It's a pretty good approach. If you if, if you if you enforce that 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 dependency complexity back down to people who actually own the code, I think that's that's a very valid approach. Yeah, if you're running one repo, 
Yeah, yeah, there is you a, understand this yeah, the only issue we have with the monorepo, uh, the, the thing I would change here probably, I mean, the, the reason why we have monorepo, first of all, I think is because the NHS.